Okay. The air conditioner. The air conditioner on. Right. So today the feast of St. Pius X, and we begin here this Friday, the September the 3rd, the young adult gathering this year, <coughs> and uh, we're good to have uh, close to 30 young adults here now at the beginning, and uh, this is uh, the Feast of St. Pius X. We'll have on Sunday the actual solemnity of the feast, but we celebrate today the Feast of St. Pius X, the actual day itself, of course, the principal patron of our society of St. Pius X, which is correctly or properly called the Apostles of Jesus and Mary. So our order is called the Apostles of Jesus and Mary, and our principal patron is St. Pius X, con er, uh, uh, canonized in 1954 by Pope Pius XII. The epistle for this feast of St. Pius X is taken from St. Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 2. Brethren, we had confidence in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God in much carefulness. For exhortation was not of error, nor of uncleanness, nor in deceit, but as we are approved by God that the gospel should be committed to us, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who proveth our hearts. For neither have we used it at any time the speech of flattery, as you know, nor taken an occasion of covetousness, God is witness, nor sought we glory of men, neither of you nor of others. Whereas we might have been burdensome to you as the apostles of Christ, but we became little ones in the midst of you, as if a nurse should cherish her children. So desirous of you, we would gladly impart unto you not only the gospel of God, but also our own souls, because you are become most dear to us. And then the gospel, taking that according to St. John, chapter 21. At that time Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? He said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? He said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said him the third time, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. He said to him, feed my sheep. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Just returning here to America from Africa, from Nigeria. And a few days yesterday in Nigeria, and a couple days ago in Nigeria, just a few days ago, meeting with young men who want to become priests of God, priests who want to establish a seminary and begin the training of young men, have already begun some work in that direction to be under the direction of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Society of St. Pius X, Marian Corps. And in the last couple of weeks, met about 20 or so young men and women interested in the religious life and giving themselves to God. And then just an hour and a half ago, with the young adults here making a little tour of the Holy Land of Kentucky, we stopped by the monastery of Gethsemane, which is only a 25 minute drive from here. And there were 31 monks sitting in the choir stalls, singing in English the afternoon hymn of praise, which we would call Vespers. And it's interesting to see the old men in the choir stalls, which a few years ago were filled with over 300 young men. Now, after 55 years after Vatican II, 31 old men. 
so that only the dead and dying belong to the new church. And the future of the church is found in the young. And these young people of the world today, many of them, they recognize that the future of the church cannot be found in whatever Vatican II gave us. Vatican II gave death to the church. It didn't give life. It didn't give truth. It gave, it gave lies. It gave death. And we begin to see, and many souls throughout the world are beginning to see, that the love and truth cannot be separated. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ spoke to St. Peter 15 days after the resurrection. After he had gone fishing and could catch nothing all night, he spoke to our Lord upon the sh our Lord spoke to him upon the shore, and he said, "Simon, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Feed my lambs." Three times he asked Saint Peter about his love. <clears throat> Three times Saint Peter responded <clears throat> that he did love Christ. And three times St. Peter was told by our Lord Jesus Christ, Feed my lambs, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. What is the proof of love? Feeding. Feeding the f food that gives life to the sheep. Feeding the food that gives life to the lambs. And this food is our Catholic faith. Feed my lambs, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Those who love will always carry a certain food with them. <coughs> the truth of the gospel. And this truth of the gospel is the only thing that gives life. At Vatican II, they decided we can bring life to our church. We can reform and revivify our church by making it more popular with the world. We will change our way of teaching from the way of teaching of Christ and the way of teaching of the fathers of the church, the way of the teaching of the tradition of the last 2,000 years, and we will find a new way of teaching. We will teach according to the world. We will live and dress according to the world. We will not be so judgmental against the world. And we will see how there will be an increase of love in our church. There will be an increase of charity and understanding in our church. And all kinds of good things will happen because we will not be judgmental and we will not be founded on doctrine, cold, hard doctrine, which is like a rock but rather we will give life-giving love. This is what matters, not the rock. And so they tried it. They tried to give love without rock. They tried to give true, uh, good charity to the world by being nice and understanding, but without the food of doctrine. And what happened? One billion Catholics baptized in the world today, and more than 900 million of them do not believe or practice in any way the Catholic faith. And the 100 million that do go to church once in a while, they do not believe in the same doctrine of our ancestors. And if we look into the families of these Catholics throughout the world, we find that there is every any sign, many signs of hate, Many signs of emptiness, but few signs of love. To try to give love or to create love without faith is a complete disaster and in one of the many lies of the devil. We want to bring the world back to a way and life of charity, but this cannot be done unless we bring back the full, complete teaching of our Holy Mother, the Church. We can only make charity stand upon a rock of doctrine, upon the rock of St. Peter, upon the rock of faith, 
We cannot make it stand upon something soft. It only can stand upon something solid. Remember what our Lord Jesus Christ himself said. Do not build a house upon sand. We don't build a house on goodwill. We don't build a house on emotions and passions. We don't build a house on niceness or a seemed, perceived niceness. A house must be built upon stone. And we cannot feed souls with love. We must feed souls with truth. It's truth that makes us work. It's truth that keeps us strong and makes us stay alive. And hence our Lord Jesus Christ said to St. Peter, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? Yea, Lord, then prove that love. Feed my lambs. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And you will go into the world teaching them everything whatsoever I have taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And we bring the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost to everything, every place, every nation, and every time. And in our present crisis in the church, we must remember that the only answer is still to teach whatsoever we have been taught. And right now there is a conservative movement in the Holy Roman Catholic Church. There is a conservative movement that wants to bring the beauty of the Mass, the true Mass, and wants to bring Catholic morality, moral families, back to the world. But this Mass, they do not center it upon the faith. And this morality is not built upon the faith. And therefore, it must erode away and fail. Why are we moral? Why do we try to be moral? Why do we try to be good? Because Christ teaches the truth, and the truth is charity. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am truth. And St. John said that God is love. God is charity. The Lord Jesus Christ is truth. And our Lord Jesus Christ is God. Hence, it is absolutely impossible to have truth without love or love without truth. Any love that is without truth, it is not real love. It is a counterfeit love. It is some kind of emotion. It is a lie. And the same is true of truth. If truth does not express itself, if truth does not spread itself in goodness and truth does not communicate itself with charity, then there is also a lie in that truth. And in the world today, they want to divide truth and love, truth and charity. We can't have any one, the one without the other. So we must recognize in our present battle to bring back Catholic tradition. We wish to bring back the whole of Catholic tradition the whole of the Catholic faith, not a part of it. And the future is this truth being fed to souls. Speaking to a couple of the priests there in Nigeria, Father Patrick Abba, Father Samuel Abba, Father Francis Mbaduga, who is here at the seminary, trained here at this seminary, and the other priests, the ones who came from the Novo Soto recognized that we tried to say the true things as best we could, but in the compromise of the Novo Sordo, and hence they could not speak the whole truth. And they tried to have the truth with a wicked new mass, and it failed. And then they tried to fit in as best they could, being as moral as they could, but their people became weaker, and they themselves became weaker anyway. Meeting two different souls on this trip who told me, one American, another one from Africa, that we see that the Nova Sordo Church and the conservative traditional movement, particularly the Society of St. Pius X and also the Fraternity of St. Peter, each year they get weaker and weaker. We are seeing eroding of the faith. We are seeing a massive eroding of the faith. So that we have the, just, just very recently, the SSPX offered Mass in the Cathedral of Toronto. And they're offering, getting more and more tightly connected with the Novo Sordo every day. And further and further from the truth. 
They are not speaking the clear doctrine about the issues of our times, such as the more recent issue of the vaccines. What does the gospel say about the vaccines? What does the gospel say about coronavirus? What does the gospel say about the rules of the modern church? In olden times, we would simply take the gospel, the truth, and give this as the food to answer the problems of COVID-19, to answer the problems of modern marriage and the spacing of children, to answer the problems of all morality and every aspect of life. The only answer to all these problems equals the holy gospel, the holy faith, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It never becomes moral to make some kind of so-called medicine out of a living, aborted, murdered baby. The baby was taken alive in order to be, be able to bring out the parts of the baby to make the vaccine. And therefore, it is a, not only a, a murder, but a cruelty to a living man and a torture of a li living baby. And then this baby's parts are then handed out to be made as parts of a vaccine. This is clearly against the gospel. To force physical medicine down people's throats is clearly against the gospel. What is the answer to these troubles? Feed the gospel. Feed the gospel. Feed the gospel. It is the answer to health problems. It is the answer to all moral problems. It is the only way to bring strength to souls. We must give the food of the gospel to souls. And this is the proof of charity and the proof of love. There must still be Catholic families, and Catholic families cannot be different from the Catholic families of old. They must be the same as the Catholic families of old. Marrying together in Christ, in the union between Christ and his church, and marrying so that they might have children, as many children as God sends, and raising these children to be children of God who are going to populate heaven and spread the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. The gospel never changes. The gospel does not change from day to day. And, it, and that in order to have charity in our times, the only way to have it is bring back the faith. This is the reason why in 1949, when Pope Pius XII was going to canonize by the year 1950 as part of the Holy Year, he wanted to make the, one of the principal acts of the Holy Year of 1950 the canonization of Pius X as a saint. And there was so much opposition amongst his cardinals and amongst the bishops of the church. The faithful of the church wanted to see the great Giuseppe Sarto canonized a saint and to be a hallmark of the year 1950. But they considered it such a great harm and such a great danger. You cannot canonize Pius X. You cannot canonize him. And why were they so opposed to the canonization of St. Pius X? Of all the canonizations of the last several hundred years, it received the most opposition of any canonization. They threatened Pius XII in every way possible. You cannot canonize Pius X. You cannot canonize Pius X. He's the great enemy of the modern world, and he is. He is the greatest threat to the heresy of modernism, which he condemned, and which was the heresy of our times. You cannot canonize him. And why were they so against this particular canonization? Bowing down to the pressure of the liberals, Pius X canceled the canonization of Pius X, so he was not canonized in 1950. He was going to canonize him in 1951, and they held it back in 52 and 53. And finally he said, no, there is too, there, he is too great a saint, and it is most necessary to canonize him. And in 1954, he was finally canonized. And why was there so much opposition? Because St. Pius X was well known as a great man of charity. He always took care of the poor. He was very gentle. He loved to teach a catechism to children. He brought the first Holy Communion back to an early age and brought back the practice of regular Holy Communion daily if possible. But why did they hate him so much? Because he was an apostle of truth. And he taught that the only way to bring peace to this world is to bring Christ to this world in his Holy Roman Catholic Church. The only way to prevent world wars, such as World War I, that he tried to prevent when he died in 1914, 
The only way to prevent this war and the future evil wars that are coming upon us is to bring the nations back to Christ. And they tried to shut him down in France. And they said, we're stealing all your churches. And St. Pius X said, the advisors, his cardinal advisors, told him in 1905, you're a young, you're a new pope. You're a parish priest. You're a simple parish priest who became pope. You don't understand the politics of the world. And right now the French government is, is saying they're going to steal all our churches if we don't bow down to their liberal and modern, modern commands. And St. Pius X wrote back very quickly to the French leaders, if you want to steal our churches, steal them. We will stand firm in the faith and will not budge. And so they legally stole all the churches, but they didn't know what to do because the whole of France was Catholic. And could they drive all the people out of the churches? Pius X could care less. And the great, or the great advisors of the time said, this little peasant has outsmarted us all. We've been defeated by the peasant parish priest. And they were very angry. And in 1905, what did he do unwittingly? He did not know, but he stood for the truth. And St. Pius X said, you, you French Masons may take our churches, but you will not take our faith, and we will be stronger. And so France became stronger in the faith. But legally, by name, they took the churches. And then came Vatican II. And at Vatican II, throughout France, and the same thing happened in several places in South America, the modernist Catholic bishops tried to destroy those churches. And the French Masons said, these are historical monuments that are legally owned by France. Therefore, you cannot destroy them. And then in a church in St. Nicholas de Chardonnay in Paris, because of the wisdom of St. Pius X in 1905, in 1975, where the French Catholics raided the church and they drove out the modernists from the church and a Catholic priest of the Society of St. Pius X came in and said Mass. And they complained to the French authorities. They have stolen the church. They have stolen the church. You must drive them out. And so the French soldiers came into the church and they saw ladies with veils on their head and they saw a priest in vestments in the front and they saw a Latin Mass and they said, it looks Catholic to me. Who stole it? And they walked out and said, the church stays as it is. And so it stays at the Latin Mass until this day. Why? Because in 1905, St. Pius X said, I will not bend to the Masons. I will not bend to the enemies of God. But his successors who came after him said we will bend to the enemies of God and they will love us and then his successors that came after him tried to destroy the church and it was the masons who said you can't destroy it and it was the masons who ended up saying we will not allow this church is having a mass we'll leave the church alone and this has happened many times throughout history our Lord Jesus Christ said, Make friends of the mammon of iniquity, and they will receive you in everlasting dwellings. Whenever you stand for the truth and do not budge from this truth, you will find that sometimes it will even be the enemies of God who come to the defense. It was a thief and a man who hated God who came to his defense on Good Friday. It was a Pharisee and a man who was a coward and was afraid to speak the truth, that stood for the truth and gave Christ a place that made it possible for Christ to be buried on Good Friday. So it will be in our times. We must feed the truth and not let the truth be taken away. St. Pius X taught this in the 20th century, and they hated very much his canonization, because when he was canonized as saint, it made it so very clear that faith and charity can never be pulled apart. The most charitable man of the 20th century was Giuseppe Sarto. And the most doctrinal man of the 20th century was Giuseppe Sarto, St. Pius X. The man most feared by the enemies of God was that simple parish priest from Riese. And the man most loved by the poor was that same simple parish priest. And they were so much against him 
because he held back Vatican II for 50 years. He gave the answer to the heresies of our times by giving us Pascendi, by giving us the catechism, the catechism, the catechism. So when speaking to the priests over in Africa and Nigeria the other day, what do they do every Sunday? They teach the catechism, the catechism, the catechism. And their catechists teach the catechism, the catechism, the catechism. And they know the answers. Who made you? God made me. Why did God make you? God made me to show forth his goodness, to know him, love him, and serve him in this, uh, serve him in this world so we may be happy with him in the next. And the answer to Vatican II is a true Catholic catechism. I'm speaking to Father Patrick. We did an interview with him just a few days ago where it said Mass last Sunday for over 1,000 people in Nigeria, over 200 confirmations. Took over an hour to, to give all the little slaps on the face. My arm was getting tired. And that, they give, and that the confirmations and the catechism and Father asked, Father, what is Vatican II? What do you, Father, have to say about Vatican II? And he simply said, Vatican II is authorized disobedience against God. That's what Vatican II is. And we cannot accept authorized disobedience. We can't follow authorized disobedience. So the Pope said it's okay to disobey, but God said we obey God rather than men. It's not okay to disobey God in the name of obeying men. And so the answer to the crisis in the church remains the same. Feed the lambs with the faith. Feed the lambs with the faith. Feed the sheep with the faith. And when we feed the lambs and feed the lambs and feed the, feed, feed the sheep with the faith, we prove love. We prove charity. We prove the love of God. And it helps make everything better. Everything becomes better. Life comes instead of death. Goodness comes instead of evil. Truth comes instead of lies. And in our world today, we are getting more and more filled with lies. And why is it more filled with lies and more and more filled with wickedness, more and more filled with cruelty, more and more filled with slavery? Simply because we no longer feed the lambs with the faith. And the conservative movement must understand we will not save the church by feeding the lambs only the Latin mass. We will not save the church by feeding the lambs sacrilegious holy communions. We, see, we feed the lambs with our holy faith. And the mass is that great powerful sacred prayer and the renewal of this crucifixion that makes it possible for us to carry this faith to the ends of the earth. So let us be firm in our faith. Let the faith be the center of all of our actions, the center of everything that we stand for. And this is the faith that gathers us together in this little young and old gathering. It's the faith that gathers us together in our masses. The faith that gathers us together in our families and in all things that we do as Catholics and everything we do as human beings. Let the faith be the center of all of it. And this will bring back a restoring and renewal of our church and nothing else will. Because we'll God bless you all. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.